Now, if you want to turn towards, uh, through the New Testament, we're actually going there today, and we're going to be in a really, really tiny letter called Philemon, if you want to turn there. Um, Philemon is the shortest of Paul's letters that we have. Uh, Paul wrote this letter uh, from one of, one of his many stays in jail. And uh, it, it's a very, like I said, it's very short, but it's a very important letter. Paul did a lot of things. Um, to, to be, you know, oftentimes... Paul, quite frankly, just comes off as, as mostly as a jerk. Uh, he, he, he's a brash character. Uh, th this doesn't put Paul in a bad light. It puts Paul in a light that, you know, he, he's, he's a brash character. He's a character that, you know, if, if walking around today, uh, churches would have to be, you know, make really tough decisions on if they wanted Paul to come be a guest speaker or not, if what he was going to say. Uh, but what Paul did at this time every time he spoke and every time he wrote was he continued the narrative that was built through the Hebrew Bible and continued what Jesus laid out every step of the way of his ministry, which was taking everything that we knew about the world, every power structure in place, every way that we thought things worked or should work, and turning them completely on their head. And, and, and Paul did this everywhere he went. Uh, Paul preached Jesus week after week in the synagogue, presenting evidence and, and having these conversations. Uh, Paul talked in places like Ephesus, where this would have been a really big deal, uh, about in, in even in the marital bed, how, how sexuality wasn't owned by one person, how, how within marriage uh, the, the woman and the man both belong to each other in this sexual relationship. Women had power and authority in that relationship, men had power and authority in that relationship, and that Ephesians 5 gives that. This was a novel idea. This was a big deal. Paul talks about how, you know, that's great. You've got money and wealth and riches, and that's wonderful. And at the end of the day, like, it just doesn't matter. And if you think God cares, God doesn't. This flipped everything on its head. Paul talked about how he uh, talked to the Gentiles and preached to the Gentiles. And he talked about how Jews and Gentiles, Greeks, Romans, everyone were equal and the same, flipping everything hierarchies on their head to the point that Peter who had been first called to you know preach to the Gentiles and he had the vision he had the dream and he went and he spoke and and he this was kind of his his niche so to speak at one point in time uh, and and he and the other apostles and disciples taught Paul about this equality and then Paul came back to visit and Peter was acting out and Paul calls him on it he's like no 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 you said that we're all equal and you're not acting like it, you better get your stuff straight. Paul took everything and turned it on its head, not for the sake of it, but because that's quite simply the message of Jesus Christ. Philemon takes another enormous social hierarchy and power structure and turns it completely on its head. It is an unbelievably powerful book in that uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you found it there, it's, it's literally probably half a page in your Bible towards the end, just before Hebrews. And there are some interesting things about it. Paul doesn't give the same kind of introduction that he always gives in his letters. And, and some of the things that we can draw from that and from his conversation is that he is very close to Philemon. This is a friend this is someone that he has stayed with in the past, that has probably supported him in the past. Philemon was well-to-do. Uh, he, he was advanced in the social structure and the hierarchy and financial status. And Paul was close. This was a friend that he's addressing. 
Colossians, uh, if, if you want to read some things this week, Colossians mirrors with this. Uh, these were probably, not necessarily, but probably sent at the same time, but certainly sent to the same place, carried by the same people, the same people are addressed in them, uh, in Colossae. And so you have this letter here, and he says, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ, uh, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. He doesn't, he doesn't give himself the title. Uh, he doesn't explain who he is or, or why he gets to speak. Uh, this is someone he knows, and he, he addresses it. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. My brothers, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Paul says your, your ministry probably, you know, your, your, your home church more than likely, but your, your ministry, your church family, perhaps your letters, but your words and what you do in your position encourage a lot of people. And he says, and, and me personally, I personally have been refreshed and encouraged by you. Verse 8, accordingly though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner, also for Christ Jesus. Paul is appealing to Philemon's uh, everything. Paul is appealing to his Christianity. He's appealing to his humanity, his sentimentality, Paul is, is laying out a case, and this is one of those where Philemon, the reader, would have begun to pick up on this and not be entirely sure where this was going. See, at this point in time, bond servants and slavery were, as they were in America, propping up much of Rome. And there were, there were differences there then in, in, in bond servants and slaves. And, and we don't know all the details of who's, of who's who. Uh, it's, but what we know is that much like the atrocities that we committed here, uh, these people were property. And, and, and when they would do something that the, the people who had, uh, counted themselves as owners over them thought that they didn't like or thought was wrong. They had power and authority to do horrific, atrocious acts towards these people. Uh, and and that, you don't have to just read biblical history. You can read any history. You can read Roman history. It, it, it was a major problem. And, and, and again, just as, as it was here, they knew... They knew that it was wrong, and they knew it was a problem, and they knew that their society was propped up so heavily on slavery that they feared a revolt so much that that then caused them, likewise, to act in even more horrific ways to try to dissuade that from happening. Philemon had a slave who ran away. And there's some nuances in the text that... that Lead can lead to believe that it was even slightly more than that. Philemon, um, slave Onesimus, probably may have stolen some things from him on his way out and then ran away. Onesimus then ends up perhaps because he knew Paul from being at Philemon's or perhaps by divine intervention, but ends up with Paul when Paul is in prison. So Philemon's 
the, the man who had run away, who was Philemon's slave, ends up with Paul in prison. And Paul is now, finds himself in this situation. And Paul addresses it in really unique ways. There are laws. And Paul knows that Philemon has legal rights to basically do whatever he wants. But here Paul takes it and turns it on its head. And he appeals to him in Christ Jesus. If you know Jesus as I know you do, Philemon, then as a, as a servant yourself, what language does Paul always use? I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a slave to Christ Jesus. Paul says, Philemon, you and I are fellow workers. You and I are brothers. You and I are equals. If I am a slave to Jesus, ergo you are a slave to Jesus, ergo Onesimus is a slave to Jesus, we're all here on this level playing field. We're all under Christ now. Let me repeat verse 8. It's important. Paul says, Though I am bold enough in Christ, no argument there, to command you to do what is required, instead, out of love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner. Look, I, I appeal to you out of love. I appeal to you out of Jesus. I remind you that I am an old man. I remind you that I'm in prison. And I'm coming to you with this. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Now, it, it says, formerly... Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Onesimus quite literally means useful. That, that name means a useful one or useful in some way. And so Paul's saying, Paul is, quite, is making a play on words here and saying, yeah, his name was useful, but he was useless before, but now, now he is in Christ Jesus and he is so very much useful to you and to me and to the kingdom. I am sending him back to you. I am sending him my very heart. Paul says, this, this is my child. I, I, have been, I have been charged with him after Paul, Paul led him to Christ in prison. Paul's in prison. Onesimus came to him or was sent to him. Paul leads him to Christ, and he says, this is my child, this is my heart, and I am sending him back to you. I would have been glad to just keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion but of your own accord. Again, harkening back to how we open this. I, I can make a command, but I'm, I'm pleading out of, out of the abundance of the heart I'm making this. Verse 15, For this, this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, no longer as a slave, but more than that, as a beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Slave that left. Onesimus was a slave that left. Onesimus was a slave to Philemon before any of this. 
then in this culture at this time, he ran away. And in that culture at that time, not only, not only was he Philemon's slave, and Philemon was above, above people in society in general, in status, in finances, in position, in power, in influence, in wealth. He was above many to most people. He was above Roman citizens in many ways, many of them. He was quite certainly above a slave that was enslaved to him. But now, not only that, it it would have been insane for there to be any type of cultural relationship between Philemon and Onesimus at that time regardless. Now Onesimus has stolen some things probably and run away, fled, escaped. And in that, Philemon has the blessing of Rome to do whatever he would like to Onesimus. And Paul says, I'm sending him back as your equal. This is earth shattering. This turns everything about society on its head. It's, this, this, this is dangerous. This is rebellion. This is revolutionary. I promise you Philemon was not in those fake slave Bibles that we talked about. It was removed as well because it could provide hope. It talked about being equals. We got to take that out. Paul says, I'm sending him back as a brother, as an equal And he goes one step further. He's like, just in case you miss it, yeah, he's your brother in Christ, but I'm sending him back. He's your brother in the flesh as well. This isn't about having a good look. This is about there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, man nor woman. There is one under Christ. And Paul says this is where the rubber meets the road. So if you consider me your partner, verse 17, receive him, receive Onesimus, as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand, I will repay it. To say nothing of, the, of your owing me, uh, even of your own self. Paul's going to throw that in, being Paul. I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Philemon, refresh my heart in Christ. Philemon, show me that there are true followers. Philemon, encourage me in my time in prison that my my words and my sermons and my letters aren't for, for nothing. Philemon, take this opportunity and show me that you actually believe what Jesus said about equality. Philemon, please... Encourage me and show me that this is real to you. Because it wasn't about another line on your resume or or a status on your Facebook account saying follower of Jesus or Christian or whatever it was. No, no, This, this meant that everything about your whole world changes. Many, many people over the last year or two, I guess, um, have talked to me about watching this, this show called The Chosen, no more, more doggedly than Jason Terry. Uh, and, 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 and I, um, I, I myself, here's my, my confessional that I've made many times before. I'm not a fan of Christian movies. I find them to mostly be really terrible. Uh, was not incredibly encouraged about this series. Uh, watched the first episode. It's like, okay, I mean, all right, watch the second episode, and Jesus shows up to Shabbat with Mary Magdalene, and I was through, just wrecked, and, and here's what it was, here's what this is all about, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, 
is trying to figure out what in the world is going on. How is this woman, demon-possessed, healed? Man could not do this. Prayer could not do this. How has this occurred? And Mary, like so many other people in this, in this show, Mary fumbles over some words a few times and then finally just says, I, I don't even know why I'm trying to explain this to you. I have no explanation. All I know is I was entirely one way. And then I just met this man and now I'm entirely something else. Not, not, not like I, I, I was, I was entirely one way and I met this man and so I decided, you know, I believe I'll cuss a little less. Like, okay. <laughs> Not, not, not. I met this man, and so I threw. Uh, I went. I went to this building, and I sat in this uncomfortable seat for an hour on a Sunday morning. Not, not. I met this man, and so I, you know, decided not to hate as much this person that I work with. No, no. I, I just met. Spent no time. Hadn't been formally trained. Didn't go to the the Jesus School of Theology. I met. I had an encounter with something so pure and so holy and so different that I once was entirely one way and now I am entirely something else. And this is what Paul appeals to in Philemon. Philemon, your house church is great. Your financial contributions are great. Your sponsorship of me is great. Your, your, your house that you give me to sleep in, it's amazing. But are you completely different? Verse 21, confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping uh, that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you, that I'll get out of jail and I'll come and I'll get to sit and I'll get to visit, make, make a room for me. I'll come. Oh, and by the way, that would mean that when I come, I'll get to see how Onesimus is doing in your house. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ and Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Ariscus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. It starts out, I, I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I prefer to do nothing without your consent. Now, if something is required, if, 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 I, if I have a rule that I require something of my child, do I then need their consent for that requirement? No. But pay attention to Paul's language that he continues to use. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. This is teaching, not the law, but the way. This is not saying circumcision of your body is required. This is saying circumcision of your heart is necessary. This is not attacking, saying you're not following the letters of the law, ergo your balance account will get out of whack. This is saying your heart is the issue. And if you are in Christ, then it's not your heart anymore. Philemon, 
I don't, think of it as this, Philemon, I don't want to rob you. I don't want to rob you of the spiritual growth. I don't want to rob you of the understanding that this is a heart issue. Philemon, I, I don't want to rob you of this step into knowing God more by simply requiring you to do something. Because if, if, if he just required it, if he just forced it, is that going to result in the change in Philemon's heart? Probably not. Does he leave Philemon any choice whatsoever? No, no, not at all. Not at all. But he says there can't be a choice because of the heart. I, I, I submit to Jesus. Jesus is my Lord, which means my, my ruler, my master. I just, you know, I just can't get behind all the stuff that he talked about. Well, then, no. <laughs> you, you, that, that's not an option. That's not an option. I, 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 Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but those people, now see, that's, that's not, that's not an option. You have the same option as Paul gave Philemon. This is the same option Jesus gave people over and over again. Either, either, we were one way. We met Jesus, and we're an entirely different way. Or that middle piece is missing. We didn't meet Jesus. Might have passed him. Might have waved at him. Might have picked out a couple things he said. It was like, I can get behind that. I can use that. But Lord, Lord Jesus Christ isn't the first, middle, and last name. Lord, Lord means we are under. We are, we are submitted. We are followers. Lord means when Jesus comes to you in the middle of work and says, hey, follow me. You don't know where you're going. You don't know if you'll like where you're going. Honestly, most of the time God has said, hey, I need you to follow me. Most of the time I didn't like where I was going. But lordship means I don't know where I'm going. I'm not sure if I like it. If I've done this before, history indicates there's a good chance I might not like it. But I know that you are over all things. You know all things. You are in all things and through all things. And if you say this is what needs to be done, then who in the world am I to ask questions? That is Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus was the man who walked this earth, who flipped the world upside down, who found the, the oppressed and the downtrodden and the outcast and the marginalized and the pushed aside and the pushed down and the forgotten and the beaten and the lost and the ones who had been told that God didn't love them and that God didn't like them, that's the man. That's Jesus. Christ is all of it. Christ is God. Christ is King. Christ is there in the beginning before anything was made, before anything was formed. That is Christ. We don't get to pick one of the three. We're blessed with the gifted, with the option of choosing all three or none. And, and, and that is an option that we are given. But picking a little bit isn't one. It's the same as none. So Philemon, Philemon, please. I'm an old man. I'm beat up. I'm in prison again. I, I, I was sent this guy, Onesimus, who's been here with me and working with me and encouraging me and helping me, and now I'm sending him away. 
And I'm back, an old man in prison alone again. Philemon, will you just encourage me and show me that this isn't all for naught? Will you encourage me and let me know that, that somebody out there knows the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these words. Thank you for Onesimus. Forgive us for centuries of ignoring books and words like this. Forgive us for centuries of ignoring who you say people are. Forgive us for our continued ignoring of understanding who you say people are. Father, let these words resonate in my heart. Let these words resonate in the hearts of all who hear your words and that your spirit would stir them in us, not let them escape, not let us push them down, not let us find an easy pass out of them, but God, that your spirit would stir them and that then out of an abundance of the heart, we would speak you. Christ's name, amen. Mark's going to uh, lead us. We'll all sing a song with him and, and praise and worship to the one who gathered us here this morning. And in, in this continued time of, of worship and praise, if, if we can pray with you, pray for you this morning, we want to do that. We want to continue to pray for I want to continue to pray for Mike Goss. Uh, he's, he remains in the hospital. Robin's sitting with him now. Uh, they're hopeful that he may get to come home today, hopeful. We want to pray for uh, Robin and Jessica and James and Mike and the doctors tending to Mike. We want to pray for, for Bill and the whole family. Um, in, our, in our culture today, I don't know about you, but the, the word saint just hangs in my throat. It does, it does not roll off the tongue. Uh, Judy Wallace, it just rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> it's easy to say for her. Uh, so I, I, I rejoice greatly uh, for her. I've had the, the literal blessing of having many conversations about, with Judy about this day coming. Uh, but uh, I'm also just broken for Bill and for the kids and the grandkids. So we want to pray for their family. We want to Continue to pray for Gail and for Tony, uh, for all the members of our family who are hurting now, but also remembering that those who were hurting a year ago are also still hurting now. Grief isn't a moment in time. Time heals all things, said someone, said someone who had never experienced true grief. So let's continue to pray for all of our family in all things of one accord, followers of Jesus. If we put Jesus at the head of everything, if we put Jesus up here and all of us worry about nothing else than trying to get closer to Jesus, then we have no option but with each step to be closer to everyone else around us who is also making that journey. Let's sing and pray and praise.